Good morning, everyone. I'm Marian Levy, Associate Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Memphis. And on behalf of the University of Memphis, I would like to welcome you to our webinar series, Telehealth for Vulnerable Populations. As the COVID-19 pandemic spreads across the world, now with only four, almost 450,000 deaths worldwide and 119,000 deaths in this country alone, it's become apparent that there's a disproportionate impact on communities of colors in terms of physical, behavioral, and even financial health. On a positive note, telehealth has become a vehicle that expands access, access to health care for vulnerable populations. Our goal with this series of webinars is to share best practices and lessons learned so that we not only improve the amount of health care, expand access to health care for the underserved, but also improve the quality so that it's culturally relevant, effective, and empowering. To that end, the University of Memphis is hosting a series of, of six one-hour webinars during the month of June 2020 related to telehealth for vulnerable populations. The topic of today's webinar is billing and technology in telehealth. We have an interesting and interdisciplinary panel of experts. Next slide, please in the fields of audiology, behavior analysis, and accounting. I'd like to introduce them now. Dr. Sarah Warren is an assistant professor in the School of Communication Sciences and Disorders at the University of Memphis. She's director of the Cochlear Implant Research Lab and founding member of the Mid-South Cochlear Implant Program at Memphis Speech and Hearing Center. Rachel Laletta holds dual master's degrees in applied behavior analysis and organizational behavior management. Rachel currently is an adjunct professor at the University of Memphis and is executive director of the Harwood Center, a nonprofit organization that specializes in education and ABA therapy for children with special needs. Sharon Lusk graduated from the Cecil C. Humphreys School of Law at the University of Memphis and is also a certified public accountant. She's co-owner of KLA Healthcare Consultants a business consulting firm based in Memphis, Tennessee that specializes in providing medical billing and other services to healthcare practices. Sharon is also a certified medical coder and a certified medical compliance officer. In the next slide, I'd like to thank the FedEx Institute of Technology for hosting this webinar series and also thank our affiliated organizations that uh, contributed to the success of the webinars. So before we begin, I'd like to share some housekeeping information. Each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes. And at the end of the three presentations, we'll open it up for questions and answers. So anytime throughout the webinar, feel free to uh, type in your questions in the question and answer box. And please de designate to whom you'd like to address your question. And after the webinar, we'll send you a link to all the presentations and also a brief survey that we hope you'll um, complete to provide feedback to us on the webinar series and additional topics that you'd like to see. If you want to receive CEU credit for social work, behavior analysis, or public health, you must complete the survey. So as you see on the screen, the CEU helper check-in and check-out codes for behavior analysis. Um, the check-in code is 6695. The check-out is 4208. It could be that this uh, behave, the CEU helper is not working currently, but you will receive credit. We'll just make sure you log in and, and have your number 6695. If you want CPH credit as a public health uh, practitioner, you don't need anything from us. Just log in to the uh, National um, Board of Public Health Examiners website and get credit for this course. So now it's my pleasure to turn the program over to our first panelist. Dr. Sarah Warren. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Levy, for that really nice introduction. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today as we continue to talk about telehealth and our current environment. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things to learn today from all of the panelists, and I'm going to begin the discussion with talking about technology platforms and access. There's a lot of questions to be had about uh, what things you need to consider. Maybe some of you are new to telehealth and looking to establish this in your practice, or maybe you have a little bit of experience but want to know more or are interested in different types of platforms. And that's what the first section of this presentation will cover. 
Okay, so I started this um, as if I myself were going to go down this journey of what questions would I even need to know? Where do I even start? And I came up with a list of questions that you really need to have answered before you can move forward with the telehealth platform. Uh, these questions involve, do you have the basics needed to provide telehealth? We'll talk about what those are. Uh, what types of services are, is it that you're looking to provide? What's your budget? And then are there any other questions that you should be asking that you don't know to ask? So um, what the, the Sometimes the question is, you don't know, well, what do you not know? You don't know what you don't know. And I'm gonna try to help you get to some of those things and provide you with some resources that can help you manage that. Okay, so the very first question, do you have the basics that you're going to need to provide telehealth services? Here's some questions that you'll need to ask. Are your services eligible for reimbursement through telehealth? The panelists that are following me in this discussion will be able to help you make a determination on that. In terms of some of the other basics that you're going to need to provide telehealth, you're going to need a laptop computer, perhaps a tablet, a telephone. There may be some other accessories that you need that you don't currently have, such as carts or web cameras, speakers, wall mounts, other things that uh, your, your practice or your clinic might not currently have that's going to be necessary to provide these services. Um, so there, one other thing that you're also definitely going to need is an internet connection. Here's some information on internet connection, bandwidth, and connectivity. Uh, I have listed out recommendations for uh, megabits per second you're going to need, depending on about how many practitioners you're going to have using the system. Uh, some things you're going to want to consider are the number of users you're going to be using, the location, are you in an urban area or a rural area, uh, real-time transactions, are you just using video services or are you going to be taking payments uh, over, over the internet, the hardware and the storage technology that you will be using. If you don't know, if you would like some more specific information on estimating your bandwidth requirements, you can check with your local regional extension center. And I've included a link here. Something else that may be interesting to many of you is you might be eligible for free or reduced priced local support. And you can get information right there on the healthit.gov on how to know if you're eligible for those types of services. The next question that you're going to want to ask is what types of services are you looking to provide? One thing you can ask yourself right away, uh, do you need a system that's integrated with your EMR, your electronic medical records, or do you really just need a standalone solution, a way to interface with your patients? So one recommendation, recommendation that I've heard is that if you are looking for deciding which platform is going to integrate well with your EMR, that's something that the uh, company that manages your EMR can provide that information for you. The delivery method, telephone or video, which is going to work for you. There may be some requirements on whether audio only services can be reimbursed or if you need a video component, so make sure you're aware of those. Be mindful of the specialized equipment you're going to need. Do you just need the video and audio connection or do you need specialized equipment such as a digital stethoscope? Can you access people when they're in their own homes or do they need to go to a remote clinical location where you have specialized tools and equipment? So for example, I'm an audiologist and a lot of what we do requires um, a special type of headphones and testing and sound level meters and um, sound controlled rooms and what might work for a lot of the diagnostic testing that we do would be a remote center in a rural location compared to interfacing with people at home. Whereas when we do our rehabilitation services, home-based services might be completely appropriate. So try to get a, a really good idea of what equipment you might need or if this can be home-based. Something you wanna be aware of is that you want to look at services that will be HIPAA compliant. Um, later on the talk, Sharon's gonna to talk to you about HIPAA compliance and how the standards have changed during COVID, but we do expect things to go back to requiring uh, HIPAA compliance. So you wanna go ahead and be set up for that on the front end if that is an option for you. The last thing I wanna say about what types of services you're looking to provide, if you don't know what your needs are exactly yet, that's okay. 
the company that you're going to work with to provide telehealth, they're going to be able to help you uh, navigate this and ask those questions to determine what your needs actually are. And many of these systems are scalable. So if the type of system or services you can do in the very beginning, if that works for you and you've later decided to expand those services, you want to make sure that you have selected a platform that allows for that scalability. If you start with one practitioner, but you plan to add several practitioners down the road, make sure that you've selected a platform that's going to allow for you to grow in that type of way. Another question is, what is your budget? So some telehealth systems, the, the, the buy-in can be as low as $1,500 and it can easily grow to $10,000 or more depending on how much specialized equipment you need. Some other questions that you need to ask is how many professionals will be using the software that's going to determine how much you need, how much training and support are you going to need. Do you have an internal IT person support staff that's going to be able to help you or is the vendor going to need to provide that support for you? What kind of training do you and your staff need to be able to use this platform? And again, is that going to be provided by the vendor or is that going to be something that you will need to do on your end? And then the next question, of course, is what equipment are you going to need? Do you have that equipment? What equipment would you need to purchase? And how is that going to affect your budget? Just a general note, uh, in the long run, you might see a reduction of overall costs because of the reduction of office staff or office supplies. You may be able to see increased productivity in the end. So when you think about your budget, remember telehealth is a really affordable option. There's many different price points, many different platforms. It's going to depend on the software and your needs that you need, the services you provide, other factors. And you can, like I said, piecemeal it together. You can buy a package or you can sm buy small bits of it that are eventually scalable as your needs change over time. You, you have to think about it as an investment. Okay, so here are some other questions that you're going to want to consider. So maybe you know what your needs are, you know what your budget is, but you don't, you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what other things that you need to think about. Here are some suggestions for you. What is your timeline? How soon are you looking to offer these services to what number of people and do you have the staff to support that? Another question you want to ask is, what are your goals? What are your short-term goals during COVID? What are your long-term goal goals after COVID? And then can you track these? How are you going to define success for your practice and your telehealth? Another question is, who's going to take primarily responsibility of managing this implementation? Is it going to be you? Is it going to be somebody else on the staff? When things aren't working right, who gets the email and the phone call? And is that person really prepared to deal with this? Do they understand who to contact with the vendor? Do they understand how to troubleshoot these solutions? This is something that you will probably want to define on the front end. And then again, you want to consider how your needs might change over time. That is something, again, you can talk about with the vendor or the different vendors that you're, that you're considering for the platform and get an understanding of how their services can be scaled up and what the cost associated with that is. So I've left you with a list of resources. I put a nice big star by this first one, the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. It has a toolkit that I think is fabulous for you to use. It has documents for you can use for training and consent so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's resources out there for you to take and modify to fit the services that you plan to provide. Also has a checklist of questions. So I provided some of the most basic questions that you want to ask when you um, move forward on implementing telehealth in your clinic. But if you want uh, a more comprehensive list of everything that you might possibly need to consider before going down this road, uh, that, that exists and that's out there. Some other um, resources are also listed here. You can request assistance if you have specific questions, but you don't really want to ask the vendor because you know they have their own objectives and answering those questions for you if you want an outsider's perspective on how to meet your needs, then there are resources associated with these organizations that will help you make evidence-based decisions in moving forward with telehealth. So there's information about access and platforms and how to make a decision about that. Our next feature is going to be Rachel Laletta, and I'll pass over the presentation to her. Thanks, Sarah. Um, 
So again, I'm going to be talking about billing and providing clinically appropriate ABA telehealth services. So my talk is going to be specifically related to ABA. Um, so as we go through that, just please keep that in mind. Um, Sarah, could you change the slide for me? Thanks. Um, so the topics we're going to be covering today is when you first decide you want to do telehealth, um, requesting the insurance providers and requesting the ABA services to be approved for an authorization, both for RBTs, BCBAs, and parent training. Then determining clinical appropriateness for the individual you will be serving, such as the schedule, the goals, what are the caregiver needs, what is their involvement going to look like for telehealth. Um, and then you want to look at recommended things you need to do on the back end more administratively before you launch a brand new service. Um, and I believe Shannon's going to go into HIPAA as well, but they have relaxed the uh, regulations with HIPAA due to COVID. Um, but it's important that we try to maintain as much HIPAA compliance as possible because as Sarah was saying, it is going to go back. So you want to set yourself up on that front end. Um, also having those welcome calls with the families, talking about these goals, talking about what the limits of HIPAA is with telehealth. And then how are you going to train your staff? How are you going to support your staff and supervise them to ensure what we're doing telehealth is clinically appropriate and effective so that we are bestly supporting the clients during this time. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to touch on billing for ABA and then Sharon will go into a lot more detail with billing. Um, next slide, please. So requesting insurance providers to pay for ABA. So you need to reach out every single provider. ABA is still relatively new. We just got our CBT codes about a year ago, year and a half. Um, so we're still brand new to a lot of insurance right now. So you need to reach out to each individual representative of all the providers that you are credentialed with and see if they'll pay for telehealth. Um, then if they say yes, you need to know, are they gonna pay for BCBA work? Are they gonna pay for RBT? I've had, I have several insurance providers that will pay for BCBAs. They will not pay for text. Um, and it's important to look at that. Also, are they gonna pay for parent training via telehealth or are they only gonna pay for supervision? Um, I've had one insurance company that will only pay for parent training, is not gonna pay for supervision. So it's very important you ask these very specific questions to each provider to make sure that when you bill, it will be reimbursed. Um, and then can you concurrently bill? So basically what that means is an ABA, you guys know you have an RBT that's doing direct care, a BCBA comes in and supervises. Concurrent billing means you bill for the supervision of the BCBA at the same time you're billing direct care of that RBT working with the therapist or working with the client. That's concurrent billing. Some insurances will allow it, some won't. Um, so it's very important you do that because that is a significant revenue um, gap between those two if you allow RBT billing and supervision versus just supervision. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, so then you wanna look at clinical appropriateness of services. Um, so you wanna meet with the family, do like a welcome call, see what their struggles are. Um, it's very different. Uh, my company went from all center-based services to telehealth. Um, the goals and the things we were working changed significantly due to supporting the family and the kids during this time. Um, so it's important not to try and stick to all the same goals and be adaptable to what the child and the family needs. Uh, for example, I have a family that they're separated because the dad can't come back in the state right now due to COVID. So we worked on the child actually attending to a screen, which typically in ABA, you don't really want a child attending to a screen, you want them to socially interact. But in this case, we needed to so he could interact with his father. Um, so that and then more functional skills, having the children learn how to get dressed and fold laundry and help with dishes, things that we typically are not gonna work on in center-based therapy as much, but it's a big deal when a child's in home all day long with parents. Um, and then you also need to consider, is it appropriate for that client? So does that client have a significant level of problem behaviors to where it wouldn't be co like conducive to do therapy with that child, but perhaps we could do parent training with the parent. So again, just kind of looking at the skill level, looking at what the child needs, what the family needs. And then you need to determine the length of the session. 
So we have several children that are, um, they have like three 30 minute calls throughout the day. And then we have another child that has the first 30 minutes is parent training with the BCBA. Second 30 minutes is direct care with the RBT. Um, so it just depends on what the child needs. And you can increase and decrease those hours as clinically appropriate and as the child adapts to this new model. Um, most of the kids look at the screen really funny because they recognize the staff they know, but they're not physically with them. So it usually takes a couple times for them to understand what's happening. Um, next slide. So other things administratively you'll want to look at is your handbook. Does your handbook include um, both your parent handbook and your personnel handbook telehealth? Um, how they should have telehealth set up. You know, they don't want to have multiple screens on. They don't want to have a lot of distracting noise. You know, making sure that therapist knows how to set up the background. You don't want a lot of distracting things going on behind the therapist that's trying to work with the child. Um, so make sure all of that is in place. And also checking your company's liability insurance. Um, if it's an umbrella insurance, it may cover it. Otherwise, you may need to look at adding something for this prior to implementing a new service line. Then you want to look at consent forms, and I'll talk about this on the next slide, but regarding HIPAA and how to actually start this. And then you have to establish a plan of how am I going to train my staff? How am I going to supervise? And like Sarah was saying, financially budget for launching a new service line, particularly in a pandemic, which makes it more tricky than in regular times. So next slide. So HIPAA. So again, we've been saying they did relax the restrictions on HIPAA. However, you really want to try to be as HIPAA compliant as possible to have that best foot forward. Um, so you want to try to, uh, at Harwood, we use Zoom, but there are many different HIPAA compliant online platforms. We just found that one seemed to work best for ABA therapy from what I talked to other therapy providers for. So we paid for the HIPAA compliant version of it. And then you want to find consent forms, which in those consent forms, you need to lay out the limitations of HIPAA. For example, if I'm doing supervision with a child and my child walks by in the background or my husband walks by, other people may hear what's going on, may hear that child's name, may hear what I'm recommending that family to do for that child. Um, so they need to understand that there are limitations to this. Um, also group therapy. I've been asked to have multiple kids on a screen so they can interact with each other because a lot of these kids don't have a lot of friends they can interact with currently. If you have that, you have parents and children that are seeing other clients and children. Um, so you need to make sure that they understand that that's a, that's a um, consideration with HIPAA. Also just us being completely electronic, making sure that they understand there is a higher risk of a breach due to that. Um, and then uh, we do consent to record sessions so the parents can watch them later and we upload them to our HIPAA compliant software that we have that we use for data collection. And we use them to train the staff but make sure that if you do that, that the parents are well aware that these are being recorded and the parents have access to them. Um, so all of these are very critical before you even start doing telehealth for ABA. The next slide. So billing. Um, so like I was saying, billing for ABA can be a little different than other providers. So we have, for example, we called all of our insurance providers and said, hey, what do we need to do to ensure that you will pay us for this service? They want us to do service location telehealth. Now other uh, therapy providers and other recommendations may say, okay, well, you need to do office location. So again, that's something you wanna ask but they said because they're making an allowance for ABA, because typically they don't authorize it across the board with all insurance providers, that it's very important that we put that telehealth in there to categorize it and attach it to our office location for billing. So that's something that you really want to ask and just get clarification on what your provider wants to do. And you might have one provider wants you to do one thing, another one wants you to do another thing, and you just you do what the people that are going to pay you want you to do, essentially. Um, and you need to document every session very clearly, precisely, and have in there the clinical backup for why it's justifiable and appropriate that this child is receiving those telehealth services. Also, make sure you convert your note and have all your documentation done within 24 hours. 
um, there are some insurance providers that will not pay if it's more than 24 hours between the start of the service and when it's converted. Um, so it's just important across the board, if you have staff under you, set that as the expectation to ensure you don't get denied. Um, and then you wanna determine who's gonna be on the call. So when we first launched telehealth, we had um, several staff on the call to train them, especially for the insurance, agent, uh, insurance providers that allowed RBTs to bill. So we did that where the BCBA run the session and had the RBTs do that. We also recorded it and had separate sessions with our staff to train them on how to, you know, appropriate um, professionalism for telehealth and clinical and how to speak to a family. And if a family has a question, how to respond to that, um, depending on what level you are. If you're an RBT, there's certain limitations, BCBAs, things like that. So you want to do that. But as Sarah was saying, financially, that's expensive because now you're paying people to train them, but they're not giving you any revenue at the moment. So you really have to balance we need to set this up, set it up right so that it's clinically appropriate and you're doing what needs to be done to help these families, but you're not shortchanging the training to where the staff don't have enough knowledge of how to do this remotely, because it is very different. Um, and then just reiterating, um, make sure that you check and see which ones will allow RBTs to bill and which ones won't, and that'll dictate who's on what call. Um, and so I think that kind of leads to Sharon, who will go over a lot more detail in billing. Thank you, Rachel. Next slide, next slide, please. We're going to discuss, discuss briefly telehealth before April, before COVID the types of telemedicine services that are available, providing and documenting those services, what is necessary, and then how to actually bill the insurance provider. Next slide. In Mar on March 6th, we got something called an 1135 waiver, which basically came from CMS, it applies to most states, uh, including Tennessee. Tennessee was a little late to get its 1135 waiver because we have TennCare versus traditional Medicaid. But this waiver basically changed the way telehealth is done. Prior to this waiver, we had to have two sites. We had to have it was mainly used in rural areas where you had a rural health care provider that would be going into a specialist in a more urban area. And it was called an originating and distant site. Both of those sites had to be approved by insurance companies before you could use it. That is completely gone. Now, the site can be the patient's home. It can be your kitchen table. We just want to be able to be able to provide pa patients the services they need with the minimal amount of risk. Then we had very strict HIPAA rules. Now the rules have been so relaxed, we can even use things like FaceTime, Zoom, not the HIPAA compliant version of Zoom, but just regular Zoom, Skype, Google Duel. Many, many providers are just using their, their mobile phones. Now, this is not a long-term solution. So if you're investing in new technology, you do want to try to get HIPAA-compliant technology. But to service your patients right now, you just try to provide them privacy. Then, telephone calls, if reimbursed, were reimbursed very poorly. Now, telephone calls are reimbursed by almost every provider, even Medicare is reimbursing telephone calls um, well, pretty much like they reimburse evaluation and management services. There's new codes that have been put forth during the pandemic that we can use. Next slide. Next 
this is one of the sites that you want to write down. It will be available in the PDFs afterwards. But this particular internet site is put up by CMS and it shows right now 238 different types of healthcare services that you can do by telehealth. It's a very, it has the CPT code on the left and a short descriptor. Then it will have the status. For example, you can do things like physical therapy now with telehealth, which you've never been able to do before. And it will tell you whether it can be done now. So whatever you use, if you want to look up the CPT and see if it's available by telehealth, this is where you check. Then it will also provide you with whether or not audio only will work. Now, we used to not be able to use audio only for many things, but shortly after we started using telehealth, we found out that many of the most vulnerable population do not have internet connections. They do not have ways, of, they do not have cell phones that, ha that can be used to show pictures. Uh, or the technology is just too difficult for them to use. So now audio is allowed many, many places where it used to not be allowed. And basically, if the doctor or the provider can talk and get the information they need via audio, it is allowed now. Next slide, please. This is actually on the CMS website. And even though it's on the CMS website, it's a little bit obsolete itself. These are the types of telehealth methods that are now available according to CMS. Of course, the telehealth visit, which we've been talking about, that's audio visual. So you need to be able, just like what we're doing now, you need to be able to see and hear who you're talking to. It used to be that that could only be for established patients. Now during the pandemic, it's also allowed for new patients. So you can see the patient for the very first time via telehealth visit and, and bill for it. Medicare is still not letting us use the 99201 codes, 99201 through 99215 for audio. But most health insurance, most commercial health insurance are wanting you to bill using the evaluation and management or whatever code you normally use for telehealth. We also have something called virtual check-in. These codes G2012 and G2010, these are telephone calls and they are for new and established patients these are no longer good for Medicare and most what we call government payers. Those are going to be things like TenCare, and in Tennessee, Cigna and Blue Cross are considered government payers. So they pretty much follow the CMS guidelines. The next thing is an e-visit, and this is something done strictly pretty much by email through the portal. A good example would be if a patient had a rash and took a picture of the rash and sent it to the provider to determine whether or not they needed a visit. And the provider responds just by email. That is a billable service. And you will, once again, you'll want to go to your different insurance carriers and find what codes they are using for that. And don't look at their normal provider manuals, look under COVID, Google their sites for COVID, and it will give you the special rules that are in effect now. Next slide, please. The virtual check-ins, remember I told you that it's on the CMS site, but it's already obsolete. We are now using for CMS carriers, which is Medicare, Medicaid, um, Blue Cross, and Cigna, and, and Tennessee because they're government payers, we're using these codes, 99441 through 99443. These are new codes that only exist during the pandemic. If you look on that chart that I showed you earlier, it's going to say these are temporary codes. Now, they, you cannot see the, cannot have seen the patient 
within seven days before filling this code or within 24 hours. If so, those are just considered bundles, bundled. So keep track of your minutes and add it to your other codes. The next area that we don't see much talk about, but it's actually really important right now, is remote patient monitoring. There are, we actually have a Memphis-based company that I am aware of, there may be other ones as well, uh, called Diversified Healthcare Partners, that have many things like blood pressure, pulse oximetry, right, heart monitors, stethoscopes, that they can send to your patients' homes. And you can bill for teaching the patient how to use it remotely, for monitoring them in the clinical time that you use with it. So this is an area that is new and it looks like this is going to continue after the crisis is over. It's not listed as things that are gonna go away at the end of the crisis. So it may be worth a phone call to um, diversified healthcare partners or there may be others that I'm not aware of. This is the only one in Memphis I'm aware of. And I know that's a, not a Memphis number. Next page, please. For telehealth visits, you do need consent. Now, this can be a little bit tricky for new patients. So it is presumed during this crisis if you have a record, if you have a recorded or audiovisual record. It's also required for tele telephone calls and verbal consent is okay for those as well, but just consider if you don't have it recorded, how are you going to be able to show that you actually have that consent? So I would suggest going ahead and getting a written consent, even if it's copied and pasted and sent via email and it's some type of email consent, it's better than nothing or having a witness coming up here. You, you want some way to prove that you've actually got consent. For all telehealth visits, it has to be initiated by the patient. Now that does not mean that the patient has to call you and ask for the visit. It can be that you call, say, you know, we are scheduled for a visit today. We are not seeing patients. Uh, we can offer this to you via telehealth, and they agree that they prefer that they want to go ahead and go forward with the visit. But you can't call and say, "This is the only way we're going to do it," and you have to have it done. That that's not allowed. Some patients are just much more comfortable with face-to-face -face visits, and that is their option. Next page, please. During this crisis, we're moving forward to a version of what next year's documentation requirements are, are presumed that we're going to have. We're moving next year away from the physical the, and going strictly to either time or medical decision making. And during this crisis, that's what we're doing as well as we're going strictly by time or medical decision making. Now, there are two different versions of this timeout. One of them is the CPT chart that we see in our CPT manuals, and the other is what CMS has published in the Federal Registry. The CPT can be rounded up. So if these are evaluation and management services, this, this is actually true for anyone. So anytime you've got a time-based thing, you basically divide it in half by CPT. So let's say it's 99203, you divide it in half, that's 15 minutes. And so if it's over 15 minutes, you can bill 99203. This is active patient care, though, only active patient care. CMS's times are based on threshold times. You have to meet the times that CMS requires, but they allow pre and post times. So if you're reviewing the patient chart, 
that counts if you're documenting the patient in the patient chart, that counts. So actually CMS times typically are more generous than the CPT because they are allowing the pre and post time. Also, time spent with the caretakers and the parents count. This is especially important during this time when you may be calling and talking to a parent about how a child is doing versus the child themselves. So that, that counts towards, towards the time element. Next slide. So how do we actually bill the insurance carriers? There is contradictory information out there about it. What CMS is saying right now is the place of service that you use should equal where the service ordinarily would be done. They're doing this because their, their original guidance was that we used O2, which is the normal place of service, O2 health code. But if we do that now, it's gonna mess up quite a few statistics that the government has been keeping for a long time about where services are being rendered. So they've made the decision that they want to use O2 strictly for where we have that originating and distant site, and they want you to bill where you normally would be seeing the patient. So if you normally would be seeing your patient in your office, it would be 11. Um, now, in Tennessee, the sole exception I know to that is Blue Cross. Blue Cross is still using place of service O2, and they're using place of service O2 because to them, it's more important to keep up with what is telehealth and what is not telehealth. What Medicare and CMS has done is they're saying use modifier 95 to indicate that you're doing this via a telehealth, via telehealth. Cigna is using telehealth modifiers GQ for audio, audiovisual and G2, GT for telephone only visits. Um, they say they will deny with a, a point of POS 02. I want to re-emphasize that most provider manuals on this are, are obsolete, obsolete. So please, when you're looking it up, look under COVID because that will tell you what, what to use. I would not use GQ or GT for anybody else except Cigna, because those codes are now being used by CMS, one of them to indicate that it's a resident service. So it's being used by residents. So it, it will cause problems if you use it with CMS. Down at the bottom, I have a, a website that has got the different waivers, and I mean, it's hundreds of pages. So pull it up and use your PDF word finder to find particular things that you're, you're looking for. Next page, please. We're hearing all over the place that there will be no audits during this time period. The only person, the only uh, carrier that has come right out and said we will be auditing is Cigna. Cigna once again has said we will be auditing and we will be looking closely at anything that is above level three that is being rendered via telehealth. Your CMS 1500 forms, and I know many of you bill electronically, but your EMRs or your practice management software still should have a place where you can do a claim note. And to avoid any type of fraud accusation, just go ahead and use field 19 of your, um, of your standard billing form, which will translate into your EMR, and say, this is how we provided the service. We provided it by Facebook. 
FaceTime, Skype, telephone, however you provided it. And then regardless, if anything comes up later on, you can always say, look, we fully disclosed to you what we did, how we rendered this. We weren't trying to hide anything from you. We are trying to provide services the best way we could to our, our patients. And this should, to a very large degree, protect you from any type of a violation under the, under the audits. Next page. The last page is more about COVID testing. I'm not going to go over this in detail because there's very few people that are actually doing this COVID testing, but I wanted you to have it as part of your PDF should you be one of those few people that are, are having it. So thank you very much for your time and attention. The next slide does have my contact information and my phone number. I'll be happy to help you with any specific questions that you have about how to bill. We have been billing, we've billed thousands of telehealth visits now, and we've had very few, very few denied. Uh, so we should be able to help you with any questions that you have. So that's the end of my presentation, and we'll, we'll turn it over for questions and answers now. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies. Excellent presentations. I learned a lot. Um, we don't have any questions and questions and answers or chat, so I think I'll ask a couple of questions. First of all, Sarah, um, how did you how do you go about picking a telehealth platform? That's, that's a great question. I when I was initially making this presentation, I had a slide built in with uh, some maybe suggestions or here's some really popular. There's over a thousand telehealth platforms out there and we just wouldn't have enough time to talk about the merits of each of those. And so a really good suggestion um, would be to, to ask some of those questions and then look at other people you know doing telehealth that had some of those same needs that you have, other people in your field. Ask them the services, the platforms that they're using and if they like them and if they don't. Another recommendation is you can get in touch if you have an EMR system that you already use you can ask the vendor for the EMR system what telehealth platforms out there are compatible with their EMR. That might help you make some decisions. That will at least get you going, but I, I can tell you from experience, if you just go to Google and search for telehealth platforms, you will get thousands of hits and lots of marketing materials, and it's really hard to narrow it down. So start, start with your friends and see what it is they're doing. Okay, great, great idea. Um, still don't have any questions. so. Rachel, maybe you could answer this for us. Um, at Harwood, how did you make the switch from um, all center-based to in-home services? Yeah, so um, with COVID, we did have to shut down all our center-based. So we just kind of, like I talked about, we just kind of went through the process. We called each insurance provider that we are credentialed with and said, you know, we can no longer do center-based therapy due to COVID. Um, what will you authorize us to do this? What would that authorization look like? Would you honor our current authorization of how many hours and what our kids did that you gave us a prior authorization for and how we need to document that? Um, so then we went through that process. And then once we got approval or got all the answers we needed to from each individual insurance provider, then we met with the staff and developed a plan of how to train them, make sure they were supported and make sure that our clinical excellence was maintained. Um, and then we had all the consent forms. Um, we are a BHCOE accredited um, agency for ABA. So because of that, um, they graciously gave us a lot of different consent forms and things like that. So we were able to use their templates um, to ensure that we were conveying all the information we needed to to each parent. Um, so that was very helpful during that time. So. And Sharon, you go ahead. Sharon, you gave us a lot of really valuable information. Um, what do you think is on the horizon after this public health crisis? I believe that healthcare as we know it will change. I do believe that we're going to be seeing more use of telehealth. Our, our company has been promoting telehealth for four years and we had very few providers actually 
offering it until until this crisis. I think since they now know that it's something very doable, that we will be seeing more of it. I think we may see a relaxation of patients having to go to distant sites to have a provider. I think we'll see more remote monitoring from homes. I do think we will see a full return to HIPAA. That's, um, I, I don't think we'll be able to do it from Skype and FaceTime and, and things like that. But So I, I do completely agree if you're investing in these services, you want to be sure that you're going with a, a HIPAA compliant version. But, but I do think that we're going to see more telehealth in the future. Patients like it. It's actually more that providers are able to see and treat more patients than they were, they're able to treat in their offices. They're able to provide their services more easily. Things like taking the pictures of the rashes and sending them in over the patient portal to see if it's just pretty much a heat rash versus someone having to come in for a, an actual visit. That may actually save some in healthcare cost. So we're gonna be looking at something new and different in the future. Thank you, thank you very much. Ladies, do you have any, any closing comments? We still don't have any questions. So um, Rachel, Sarah, or Sharon, do you have anything else you would like to, to mention? Um, I don't really, but if anybody has any questions specific to ABA or they're welcome to reach out, my email's on the Harwood website um, and I can try to help with any kind of clinical questions or anything regarding telehealth with ABA. Okay. The last point I would like to make is that to emphasize that this is an opportunity. As the other panelists have said, that this is the direction things are going in, that there has been Lots of talk about telehealth before now. I um, have been talking about telehealth for a while and I remember the discussions within my field of telehealth used to be three or four people and now it's rooms full of people talking about telehealth. And I think that's here to stay. And so there is an, uh, a buy-in on the front end when you invest in your platform and you investigate the billing and you spend time and money on this, but it really is an investment in the future. It really is something that uh, you know, now that you have it, you're gonna want it. I think about um, something as simple as, as the backup camera on my car. I was like, oh, this is really great, but now if I'm in a car with my husband's car and I don't have the backup camera, I feel really insecure because I want that. I think telehealth is gonna be the same way, that there is no going back. There's not, you, you can't remove that now that we have it. You, your patients are gonna want it. If you use it, you're gonna like it. So think about this as an opportunity and investment instead of a burden of something that you have to provide now. If you frame it that way, I think you're gonna find that it can. it's really enjoyable and it's a really great way to provide access to people who may have had otherwise had barriers to your care previously. Well, that's excellent point. And thank you, ladies. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Warren, Rachel Laletta, Sharon Lusk. Um, special thanks to the FedEx Institute for hosting this webinar, uh, the webinar series, Dr. Jasbir Dhaliwal, Rami Lote, Claudio Don Dellinger, Marianne Dawson, and Teresa Franklin. And I'd like to thank all of you who are watching. Thank you for your support, and thank you for all you do to improve the health of our nation. Uh, we'll be signing off. Hopefully, we'll have additional webinars in the future, but thank you all for joining us. Before we sign off, can we make sure we get the BCBA code? The BCBA is 4208. The checkout is 4208. Thank you all.